Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, you'd better have a strong stomach. If you watch any amount of television, you know that first responders see some pretty messed up stuff. Those who work in the medical field see the worst of it especially those who work as EMTs or those in emergency rooms. We're going to look at just a handful of cases that had even those battle-hardened medical workers taking a step back wondering how that case ended up on the gurney or table in front of them. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite somebody else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com, where you can find me on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also join the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Hospital workers see all sorts of crazy things on a daily basis. It might seem they'd eventually get used to it after working in the medical field for a couple of years, but every now and then a patient comes along with a shocking ailment or injury that just absolutely boggles them. Here are some of those one-in-a-million cases that made doctors and EMTs say, how the heck did that happen? From Garrett K. EMT here. I got called to our local limited capability ER to transport a patient and a critical care team to a trauma center. I got into the ER and headed over to the patient. The patient's room was a horrible mess. Dressings everywhere and blood on the ceiling and floor. Imagine any scene from any overacted movie where the medical professional yells, don't you die on me, like that. On the bed was an older woman with her leg exposed, and the doctor was doing some stitches on her shin. No biggie. It was the kind of thing you'd expect the doctor to spend five minutes on deciding if a Band-Aid was good enough or if it actually needed surgery. It completely failed to line up with the scene around them, like the housekeeping department was on strike or something. Anyway, it turned out that the woman had banged her shin into the steps of a shuttle bus, her husband then drove her to the ER closest to their house, 45 minutes away, bypassing six other hospitals, including the one we ended up taking her to. Apparently, when she walked into the ER, she said to the nurse, I think I'm going to die, and the nurse responded, I think you're right. She was on aspirin, warfarin, and some form of chemo. She had virtually no clotting factors, and the ones she had left were inhibited. So, what would have been an annoying bleed for most people, which would have easily been controlled with pressure after a few minutes, was actually a very small, uncontrolled arterial bleed which sprayed everywhere. We got her down to the trauma center without any additional complications, but I have no follow-up from there. From Serpent's Gate 72 My wife was a social worker at a dialysis clinic. She came home frazzled early one day. Apparently, a regular patient who came in got his central catheter, PICC line, pulled out of his neck, and it happened in the weirdest way, as he was pulling off his sweater at home. Instead of walking to the ER, which was across the street, he drove there and he sprayed blood all over the foyer area. A couple of nurses got to him and controlled the bleeding as best they could while my wife called an ambulance. She said the amount of blood was indescribable. He parked out front, so they had to move his car. They couldn't drive it because of the amount of blood in it, and it had to get towed. She said it looked like a murder scene. From Heather Forever 
My dad was a medical lab technologist, and when he was an intern, the lab techs got paged to go down to the ER to draw blood from a patient. Since my dad was a young guy and fresh out of college, he raised his hand to go down, despite the more senior techs warning him not to go. He went down, and they had IVs everywhere. The patient tried to end it all with an electric knife, like the one that gets used to carve turkeys, and he tore everything in his neck. The only thing keeping his head to his body was his spine. My dad had to draw blood from this patient's ankle since everything else had been taken up by units of blood just hanging there. When he came back to see his co-workers in the lab, he was as white as a ghost. They warned him not to go, but him being young and eager, he went. He has more stories from when he worked in Detroit as a lab tech in the ER for a Level 1 trauma center. He was there when Detroit was not a very nice city, and he saw the decline in danger since he left earlier this year. Sent in anonymously A teenager got in a fight with his brother, of course, both under the influence. They were fighting over a girl. The brother smashed a glass coffee pot and attacked the dude in the neck, and when he saw blood, he ran. Somehow, he managed to miss all the major vasculature in the neck. This was out in the bush, so I got to take this guy to the nearest major hospital with a trauma surgeon on standby. On the way, his mom called and told him he better not rat his brother out, since he has a record. They then proceeded to get in a shouting match, and he started thrashing around. I took the phone away from him and told him to lie still unless he wanted to die, and then administered more morphine. Later, a CT scan showed he was only a centimeter away from having a carotid nicked and dying. From Yuli 2000 Medical specialist here. I worked at an inner-city hospital that was kind of the red-headed stepchild of hospitals in the area, but, well, that's another story. We were a community hospital that did primarily cardiac care, but we also had a small ER. We were in the middle of the trauma triangle, that is, three large level one trauma centers, so we rarely saw much of anything in our ER. It was usually just glorified primary care and cardiac patients diverted from the other level one trauma centers. But one time, while working a night shift, we got a call from the fire department saying they were responding to someone with a self-inflicted bullet wound. This was an unusual patient for us to get, but they were all on divert, and we were the closest facility. Being a pretty boring ER for the most part, all the staff there got a bit excited to finally have a real ER patient. The fireman rolled in with the patient a bit later. Apparently, the guy had called his friend from a rundown hotel, said he was going to end himself, and then hung up. The friend then called 911, and emergency workers rushed to the hotel. The patient arrived intubated with CPR in progress, but there was no visible wound anywhere. I was on the chest doing CPR, and my supervisor was bagging the tube. He told the doc that something wasn't right with the bagging, and he didn't think the tube was in. My supervisor pulled out the tube, and the doc went to intubate the patient. While trying to insert the tube, the doc yelled loudly, "'What the heck?' He then asked for the McGills. It's a type of forceps used occasionally for intubation procedures. He proceeded to yank out a bullet shell from the patient's trachea. After the code was called, we did a closer examination and noticed the guy's two front teeth were chipped. The coroner concluded that the guy didn't have the weapon, but he had the shell, and he put the shell in his mouth thinking that he could set off the primer with a hard bite. The guy bit down, chipped his teeth, winced in pain, and inhaled the shell into his trachea. The fireman didn't notice the obstruction and put the tube into its esophagus. I've seen some crazy stuff in my 20 years, but this was by far the strangest. From Far End RN I had a guy rush into the RN saying his brother had been blown up. He opted to drive him in because he foolishly assumed that that would be quicker and safer than calling an ambulance. We went out and got the guy out of the car. He literally looked like one of those Looney Tunes characters that had an explosion backfire. We ended up having to put his armband on his foot because his hands were literally melting off his arms. Surprisingly, he was relatively calm and lucid. Endorphins are a heck of a thing. When we asked what happened, he said his oil tank in the truck exploded. 
I don't like to generalize, but our demographic tends to dabble in the forbidden, so we assumed it was actually some shady operation gone wrong. From Womb Raider I was working for this small engineering company which had very old lathes. I was only going to work there for six months to get experience for a better job, but my second-to-last day was a nightmare. The lathes were these big old things that did not have any of the safety guarding that most modern machines have. They were primarily used to make parts for World War II aircraft. I was working on one, and I knew how dangerous those things could be, so when I was running them, I had my wits about me. But the guys who'd been working there for 30 years or more had become really complacent with them. To give you an example, whenever I measure an aircraft part, I always turn the machine off and then start it back on, just to be safe. But that takes ages, so the other guys just leave it on. One guy started measuring his part, and his overall's sleeve ended up getting caught on it, wrapping around the spindle. Behind the machine is a metal plate designed to stop metal cuttings from going everywhere, but the gap between it and the spindle is about three inches. The guy got wrapped around and was pushed into the three-inch gap, then came out the bottom onto the workshop floor. It looked like a crash test dummy being hit by a car. I definitely do not want to see a person with literally every bone in his body broken again. So now I work as a safety officer. I have every right to be a witch about safety. From Mabilal Anesthetist here. I was once on call and had an emergency trauma case. We usually got a few of those every day, and they normally consisted of people who fell from a certain height or suffered a minor car collision. I came down to the resus department and was told it was an 18-year-old patient with stabbing to the chest and lost output. It was my first time dealing with this type of scenario, so the adrenaline got going. I called for immediate help from the consult on call. Multiple surgical and ED personnel arrived to be on standby. I work in a district general hospital, so we don't have facilities for cardiothoracic surgery. At the time, our only hope was to cut open his chest and hope there was something that we could treat. The young man arrived by ambulance with CPR in progress, and there was blood everywhere. His clothes were soaked, he was blue and pale, and there was vomit in his mouth. I took over the airway and intubated him while the ED doctor and surgeon started to quickly cut open his thorax in ED. Within 30 minutes of arrival, they'd cut away his entire rib cage, lifted it up like a flap. I could literally see his entire heart and lungs. Huge amounts of clotted blood fell out of his chest. His heart was palpitated, but he lost enough blood that further CPR was futile. His official time of passing was three minutes after his arrival. The authorities took over for evidence, and we all washed our hands of the blood and went back to work. I could not sleep that night or for a few days after. From Ian McKellen to Generous The other night, one of my crewmates transported a person to the ER. The report went something like this. Uh, we're en route to your facility with a patient and uh, her pacemaker. Well, it, it fell out. Vitals are within normal limits. We'll be there in five minutes. The nurses were all like, yeah, right, dumb paramedics. How can a pacemaker fall out? Well, they soon arrived with the patient, and indeed, her pacemaker had fallen out. She got it like 20 years ago, and the skin just opened up. There was no blood or anything, just plop, the pacemaker popped out. You could see some adipose tissue, again, no blood, and the pacemaker hanging by wires from their chest. No pain, no accident, no apparent self-injury. From Tiny Parfait My boyfriend was the patient in this story. He was an eight-year-old boy with type 1 diabetes, and he's had it since he was five years old. His blood sugar got out of whack one day when he was a kid, and he was admitted to the hospital. The kid had been getting his fingers pricked and having insulin injected for years, so nobody thought he'd have a problem getting an IV put into his arm. They were wrong. Apparently, one nurse staggered out of his hospital room with a visible sneaker print across her face, while another nurse got knocked unconscious. It took nearly a dozen people to restrain and sedate this scrawny little kid. 
He still has a phobia of needles today, and even now usually needs sedatives. The only real exception is putting his insulin pump line into his stomach. Submitted Anonymously Mexico's Independence Day is September 16th, but aside from the parade, all the celebrations take place on the 15th. It's the busiest night of the year for paramedics as all sorts of craziness ensues, from stages that fall under the weight of tipsy people to street fights between rival hoods. And then there's this guy. He impaled himself with a flag. He probably climbed a fence or something and was waving it when he fell and it went through him. But what was really shocking is that he was so tipsy, he was still waving it while lying on the floor and half the mast was inside of him. Patriotic as heck, though. We nicknamed him Pedo, slang for tipsy. Pedo Escucia, a hero of the Mexican-American conflict who threw himself at the flag of a castle to prevent it from being captured by the enemy. From Elephant Dog Puppet Cat I'm a psychologist who works in prisons. One guy was so imaginative with his self-harm that he is now used as an example in officer training. There were so many things he did to harm himself that I couldn't list them all here, but the one I'll never forget was when he used the plastic from a packet of Tim Tams as a sharp object to create an opening in his skin. But that's not the most disturbing part. He patiently waited until his one hour per day time in the exercise yard to grab a fly, and somehow managed to not let the officers see it, even though he was handcuffed hands and feet. He then inserted the flying insect into the wound, and eventually his wound became a home for larva. From Bullcrap Temporium Here are a few to boggle your mind. A honey crisp apple up the butt, just your average night. A lady whose throat was injured with a broken glass bottle. Many reconstructive surgeries later, I hear she's doing well. A hallucinating man who was convulsing after attending an EDM festival. He literally looked possessed. Twenty security guards later, even after we finally got him restrained, I'm seriously surprised he didn't die as he was incredibly messed up. But this last one was something else. We had a guy come in stating he was involved in a carjacking and was attacked. His head was bleeding, his heart rate was high, and since he claimed that he'd been attacked, the attending doctor decided that we were going to take him to the resuscitation room, which is protocol. As we're taking him there, a pregnant woman arrives via ambulance. As soon as they saw each other, the man yelled something like, That's her! That's the lady who took my car! Like a bat out of the depths, the pregnant lady jumped off the stretcher and bolted out of the hospital. Security went after her, but she was gone. I don't know if she was found later on or not. From Scarlet Nightingale My dad got his axe tangled in a hammock when we were camping, and he ended up with it in his leg instead of the wood. Yes, he's aware that he was supposed to check his perimeter. He had initially, but the log had rolled several times, and he just got frustrated and moved with it. It went right between the tibia and fibula, chipping one of them and slicing through the artery. He ended up having to have vascular surgery to repair the artery. He spent two and a half months in a cast. It took a very long time for him to regain the feeling in the top of his foot. From Thrice 18 I'm a surgeon. My favorite trauma case I saw in residency was a guy who came in with a golf club through the bicep muscle belly of his left arm. How did it get there? Well, he was playing at a friendly adult soccer match when things got a little heated. He said he felt threatened and retreated to grab a handy golf club from his car for protection. He then returned to the soccer pitch and confronted the other player who threatened him. Things got more heated and he took a swing at the dude with the club. This only broke the head of the club off on the other guy's body. Another dude then grabbed the club and then attacked him with his own golf club. So he showed up to the ER with a golf club through and through his biceps. It actually didn't bleed that much when we took it out. Here's another anonymous entry. I have a good friend who described what a local hospital calls a Code Alex. I've changed the name for HIPAA purposes. 
He said that several times a week, a man with mental health issues and an ostomy – I don't remember the specific location of the bag – would do something intentionally to be admitted to the hospital and taken by ambulance. What he did to get himself admitted was different every time. He may have impaled himself one time or poisoned himself another time, etc. The EMTs would call the hospital ahead of time and warn them of a code Alex when they picked him up. Anyway, he was a very large man, around 350 pounds, and he'd always have to be restrained because he got violent with the healthcare workers. But he got to the point where he was able to get his ostomy bag off, and, and I kid you not, he would use his ostomy to try to cover people in excrement. I'm guessing he had a lot of gas in his intestines because that would be the only way to do what he did. My friend's not somebody who lies or exaggerates, but it's hard to believe somebody would be this skilled, vindictive, and disgusting. From Emma Lou Who Thankfully, I was not there for it, but at the hospital, a man pulled his ostomy bag off and threw it over his nurse's face because he was angry about something. This was a completely oriented guy with no mental health issues, if you don't count the absolute jaw-dropping reach of his rudeness, and this wasn't the ER. He ended up being charged for assault for doing this. One incident I did witness, and it was so ridiculous I'll never forget it, I saw a guy actually use his catheter bag as a whip. He was smacking the tech, trying to restrain him. We had to pull it off of him to get the bag away. It ended with me basically kneeling on his chest to restrain him while trying to pull the catheter off. It was just placed so that the thing was stuck on. When security came in, it took four of the bigger guys to hold the patient down. He was maybe 115 pounds. Just insane. Some of the things you see in the field. From IR1114 I spent a few months in a psychiatric hospital a couple of years ago and was in a wing of teenagers between the ages of 14 and 18. We were there for a variety of reasons, but a lot of us had attempted to end our lives, so of course they were super strict about keeping us away from anything that we could use to hurt ourselves. I mean no shoelaces, hair ties, pencils, pens, shampoo in quantities large enough to be poisonous if ingested, etc. Anyway, my roommate at the time was on unit restriction and basically was not allowed to leave the room. When I was gone one day, she broke open a plastic travel size lotion bottle and dug the sharp, broken edge into her neck. She was unconscious and still bleeding when I got back and found her, and she was taken to the ER. I was told she ended up okay, but I never heard for certain because she didn't come back in the time that I was there. I gotta wonder what the doctors thought when a kid was brought in with half a lotion bottle sticking out of her neck. From Faux Vol. An otherwise healthy young man had to have one of his legs amputated after an accident. I met him months after that. He was so depressed he hadn't moved at all in that time, even if he still had one leg and no other mobility issues. It doesn't sound so bad, but he actually had the worst pressure ulcer I've ever seen. As in, a good chunk of his hip bones was visible. The skin had separated from the rest of the tissues around his lower back, forming a sort of pocket big enough that you could actually stick your hand inside. I don't know what happened to him as I left that hospital shortly after he'd arrived. From Meister Nas ER nurse here. I was working a night shift one day when I got a standby case of an infant drowning and the mother entering hypovolemic shock. Initially, I thought it was a mother trying to do a water birth thing that went wrong. Turns out the girl was underaged, and her family didn't know that she was pregnant, so she gave birth to the baby in the toilet over the toilet bowl. The reason the baby drowned was because she let her baby sit in the water for some time before calling the family for help. By the time the paramedics reached them, the baby was no longer breathing, and the heartbeat was fading away. Luckily, they reached us in time to stabilize both of them and sent them out to a woman's and children's hospital for closer monitoring. That whole story baffles me to this day. From Shield Bearer I worked as a patient transporter at a large county hospital with a level one trauma center. 
basically a trauma center that can handle everything you can throw at it, for several years. Two things stand out to me. Firstly, I had a patient roll into the ER with an injury uh, down there. It was odd, but we didn't think much of it until the guy rolled onto the unit holding what was supposed to be down there in his hands, accompanied by two officers. Turns out Numbnuts was running from the officers, tried to jump a fence, slipped, and cut himself open. Secondly, I had a tipsy guy arrive at the unit on Cinco de Mayo with a fence post stuck up his backside. According to him, he'd been walking along the fence, while tipsy, as you do, and he slipped, lodging it up there. When the attending surgeon, who was black, decided to question the logistics of the patient's injury, the patient chose to unleash several ethnic slurs in the surgeon's direction. Well, he definitely lived to regret that. The jerk ended up getting the fence post removed without any anesthetic. The surgeon in question was definitely an enormous prick and could be a downright belligerent jerk at times. This is definitely one of those times. I never did hear how that fence post actually got up there. From Engreedy My sister is a doctor. She was during her neurosurgery rotation when hospital personnel told her of a bullet wound victim. Doing the math, bullet wound, neurosurgery, they already expected it was going to be bad. My sister rushed into the room where she found a female patient seated on the bed, with a bullet stuck between her eyebrows. Nonchalantly, the woman just greeted my sister, saying, Hi, Doc. Turns out her abusive husband pointed a homemade firearm square on her forehead and fired. The bullet probably misfired, resulting in it not penetrating the skull completely. A few rotations later, my sister bumped into her in the psych ward. From Just Some White Guy A 40-something-year-old male walked into the triage and stated slowly and uncomfortably, So, uh, I lost a bet. Turns out he somehow forced a Kong toy up his backside and couldn't get it out. King Kong. We're not talking about the small King Kong toys, either. He ended up needing surgery and lost part of his colon. Nobody had the guts to ask him if he filled the Kong toy with peanut butter first. Another time, there was a patient who came in after being in a motorcycle accident. Apparently, the kickstand of the bike impaled the rider's knee, then somehow bent to the point where he couldn't get it out. Looked like a really thick paperclip weaved through his knee. But perhaps the most memorable story I have is when a patient came in with a security escort for acute psychosis. He tried to end his life with his truck trailer on the side of the interstate when police intervened. He quickly deteriorated, and during intubation, when they pulled a blade out of his mouth, it was completely covered in a thick, bright blue sludge. We later find out he had been huffing paint and accidentally aspirated a whole bunch of it. From PTSFN 54A My stepfather was a nurse in an emergency room. One day, a man came in who had chopped off a few of his fingers while working on his car. He was working on something toward the front of the engine, and while the motor was running, he reached in for something. That's when the fan blade cut his fingers right off. They were able to reattach his digits and send him back to his normal life. So far, nothing too strange, you might say, but wait. A few weeks later, the same man walks into the ER again, this time with a fan blade sticking out of his shoulder. Apparently, it got bent when it chopped off his fingers, and it was hitting other parts of the engine making a noise, so he was attempting to straighten it out. He took the blade off, bent it back into shape as best as he could, then he reattached it and started up the engine to see if it was spinning correctly. After the third adjustment, he did not properly secure the fan blade, and when he was checking to see if it wobbled, it flew off and struck him in the shoulder. From Paws to People I was an animal vet tech. We had this golden retriever come in for diarrhea, vomiting, and no appetite. The vet checked her out with a physical exam and sent the dog home with meds. A few days later, the female owner returned and said that there was no improvement. Well, this time we hospitalized the dog and took x-rays. On the x-ray, there was definitely a foreign body in the intestines. 
but it was hard to tell exactly what it was. The usual foreign bodies are baby pacifiers, socks, bones, and parts of rope toys. Surgery to remove it was scheduled, and the vet showed the owner the x-ray, asking her what the object might possibly be. Had the dog had a history of getting into anything? The owner said no. The next day, we did the surgery, and what we found was absolutely shocking. We pulled out 13 pairs of satin, sexy thong underwear, all stained in green bile from the dog's intestines. We put them in a plastic bag to show the owner. Surely the owner must have noticed over a dozen pairs of her underwear were missing. That afternoon, the owner came in and we showed her what we found during surgery. She was livid. She told us that she didn't wear that style of underwear, and she left in a huff, all ticked off. The next day, her husband came in to pick up the dog and pay the hefty bill. He told us he'd been cheating on his wife and the thongs belonged to his mistress. When he walked with the dog, he scolded her for outing him. The wife kept the dog in the divorce settlement. Shortly after this, I left animal medicine to work with humans. I miss that job every day. Humans bite more than animals. From Picknut I was the first person on the scene of a car accident. This old woman took a left turn into another car. I stopped and ran to her after calling 911 and thought to keep her calm until the EMTs arrived. She had so much blood down her face and chest I couldn't figure out where she was hurt until she tried to speak. In the accident, she had bitten through her tongue. I kept talking to her until they arrived and tried to keep her from talking. She was totally out of it. I still can picture her tongue hanging out of her mouth by a tiny piece of flesh and her trying to talk around it. From I Sold My Soul for a Twix So I was the idiot in the ER this week. A Wednesday night after work, 10 p.m., I just got home and realized I didn't have any of my sleeping tablets, so I just took one of my mom's. Problem was that my mom's tablets weren't end-coated, and they got stuck on the back of my tongue, causing me to gag and inhale sharply. When I inhaled, the tablet unstuck, itself lodged in the duct of my right lung, cutting off the airflow to said lung. It took me 10 minutes of coughing, vomiting, gasping, and giving myself a bloody nose before the thing came out. I calmed down and went to bed. I figured, well, it's out now, and I'm fine. Boy, was I not fine. By the time I got to my second job the next morning, I had serious pain in my lung, and it was affecting my breathing. So I went to the ER. The nurse thought I was joking when I told her the story, and the doctor I finally saw actually asked me how the heck that happened. All in all, I'm fine. I have scratches in my lung duct and down my throat, and I still have a bit of trouble breathing, but otherwise I'm in tip-top shape. Still, that was scary. From Real Ultra Lord My cousin works in the ER. One night, two paramedics were wheeling in a stretcher with a man on it. The paramedics were grinning from ear to ear and had a hard time not bursting out in laughter. The man on the stretcher was completely covered under a blanket only his hands and feet revealed that he was lying on his stomach. The nurses and the patients in the ER were slightly confused because it all seemed like they were wheeling in a dead man. The whole ER was filled with suppressed laughter until a third grinning paramedic came in carrying a vacuum cleaner. He put the pipe under the blanket between the legs of the man. Turned out that he had put something in his backside and it somehow got stuck in there. Another guy was wheeled in on a wheelchair, followed by two firefighters with some heavy equipment. He had a massive padlock on his private area for uh, reasons. When the lady he hired wanted more money for her services, he refused, so she left with the key. They brought him to the ER because they didn't want to take any chances of infection. From Lucy in the Sky I was working in a rural ED when we had this guy and his gal come in. The guy was crying and his girl was covered in blood. In amongst the tears and both of them freaking out, it transpired that they'd been out at dinner and afterward had spent some time together in the car park. 
Well, things progressed from there, and it must have been dark or something because before they knew it, this girl was covered in blood. Freaking out, they hastily got themselves to the ER. Both were upset on arrival that she'd maybe miscarried a child, although neither was sure that she was even pregnant. Well, it turns out, after the gynecologist's review and several hours of assessment in the ED, she was just on her period. Well, it must have been a really bad period as there wasn't an inch of her and a good part of him that wasn't covered in blood. From Early Hemisphere My brother cracked his skull on ice and he was taken to the ER when we were young. I remember it vividly. My brother got knocked over by another skater. He started crying and got medical attention immediately. I was so confused, people kept reassuring me that my brother was going to be okay. He got taken away in an ambulance along with one of my parents. Apparently, the crack in his skull just missed a very sensitive part of his brain, and if it was any bigger than it was, it would have been incredibly fatal. My brother literally dodged a bullet that day. From Dis Says Stuff Into Things I was an X-ray tech at the time. A trauma patient rolled in, just waiting there in the trauma room, ready with my portable x-ray machine to do my part. Then, out of nowhere, a teenage girl on all fours came through with a pretty big fence post going right up and through, well, everything. When I checked to see exactly how deep it was, I found that the giant fence post just went through her entire bottom. She was immediately rushed to OR. The story goes that she was locked in her room and freaked out that she couldn't get out, so she jumped out of her window and landed on a fence post. I'm sure substances were involved in some way. Here's another one from Scarlet Nightingale. My high school physics teacher was also the track coach. He told us a story about how, when he was in high school, he was at a meet where someone had the bright idea of putting the javelin range immediately adjacent to the track with the throwers throwing toward the track rather than away from it. The javelins also happened to be a very similar shade to the dirt of the track. One of the javelins had gone through the fence between the range and the track and had embedded itself there. No one on the track side realized this and the throwers were not able to retrieve the javelin before the next race began. He said he was standing around watching the race and one of the guys running just stopped dead as he came around the bend. Turns out the runner couldn't see the javelin and ended up getting impaled through his thigh, although everybody watching said it looked like it came through his nether regions. I cannot for the life of me remember why my teacher felt compelled to share that story with us. From Quick Peak 81 as I was working the night shift, a dude came in with four officers and a bunch of restraints. He was naked, bleeding, and screaming. Great! So we did some blood work, sedated him, and tried to figure out what the heck he was on. Overall, the guy seemed okay, but we made some fatal errors. One, we failed to do a pupil check, and two, we let the new grad do the blood draw. The dude immediately stood up, shoved the student nurse, and started throwing stuff. As I waited in to try to calm him down, another nurse came in to play bad cop. This enraged him, so I turned to the new nurse to tell him to back off. At that point, my back was facing the patient, which was not good. He picked up his IV pole, swung it like he was going for a world record, and hit me across the back. I heard my ribs crack. I hit the floor, flipping around like a fish out of water trying to breathe. The officers came in to secure the dude and decided to stick him with 24-hour monitoring. I was still trying to breathe and cough, which hurt a lot. That day I learned a valuable lesson. Do not turn your back on anyone. Also, we never did find out what he took, but we had a suspicion that it was some new street substance making its rounds in our area. From India Reef I had a patient while I was in the Air Force who tried to end his life by taking a rotating saw to his neck. When that was unsuccessful, how it was unsuccessful I still don't actually understand, he then wandered three miles into the woods hoping to just slowly bleed to his end. His wife found the blood, called the base officers, and they ended up finding him just wandering around in a daze. He lived. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. 
I ended up seeing him a few months later when he came into the facility for a follow-up and he stopped in to see the ER staff that night. He was very apologetic and couldn't even remember why he did what he did. From Crap Fiddle Years ago, I was working as an ER doctor. A dad brought his three-year-old daughter in. They'd been eating pizza and she started choking. He opened her mouth and saw a red lump in the back of her throat, so he stuck his finger in and hoiked it out. Some fairly brisk bleeding followed, which had stopped by the time they came in. He brought his three-centimeter piece of meat with him in a handkerchief, but it didn't appear to be from the pizza they were eating. I had a look in this happy little girl's throat without a problem. Yep, only one tonsil to be seen. The other was in the hanky. From 96 Poppins Not an ER staff person, but the ER staff were pretty shocked when my adult brother came in for care after he cut his backside with a small electric pruning chainsaw. He was standing on an orchard ladder with the saw resting on the top step and his toddler shook the bottom of the ladder. That's when things went haywire. My dear brother grabbed the saw, somehow engaging the starter mechanism, and whirred it right into his rear end as he fell off the ladder. Forty-two stitches to close the jagged wound. He said that his rear was on show as many staff people came by his ER room to check out the weird butt wound. From Rach Abe I had a woman come in for months complaining of random abdominal pain. Every time she came in, the pain was at a different location. She had x-rays and a CT scan, but nothing showed up. One night, as she was laying in bed, she felt a sharp pain in one spot. She pressed down on that area and felt a very hard object poking through her skin. She pinched it between her fingernails and pulled it out. It was a five-inch wire. It turned out to be part of a barbecue brush that was fraying from about five months earlier when they barbecued burgers last. Lesson learned. Replace your barbecue brushes often. From J. Wag. I was a very new nurse when a guy came in by EMS after an attempt to take his own life. This was his third attempt, according to family. The first time, he took too many sleeping pills and ended up sleeping for 36 hours. The second time, he tried hanging himself, and the rope snapped. This time, he went all out. He took a chainsaw to his throat. It was a huge, gory mess, but the actual teeth of the saw ended up getting snagged in his shirt and stopped the saw. He was able to go through a lot of muscle and fat, but he didn't hit anything major. The best part was you could actually see his carotid artery pulsating. It took the doctor somewhere around 300 sutures and two hours of sewing to get him put together again. He was a really polite guy the whole time, too, so I'm sure he was embarrassed by the whole thing. From Oracle 9999 One frat guy came in with pain, which was pretty obvious in his backside. He was a bro through and through, so I thought maybe he would be embarrassed by the situation, but nope, he was honest and upfront, not for the pain meds, but for the pain to stop. He had a pool noodle, or the part that they didn't cut, just stuck up in there. It started as a dare, and multiple people at the pool party egged him on, so he took the challenge on by using something to help ease it in, then boom, the pool noodle was in the keister. Long story short, it hurt him severely and there was blood, so it was no good trying to pull it out. He ended up having it removed under surgery, and then ended up having an ostomy, because he was damaged beyond repair. From Moxifloxacin 25 one time I was sitting in the ER with a broken foot and I watched this father come in crying, carrying his toddler son. The kid had no shirt on and I could see that he had what looked to be pieces of tire tread stuck in his torso. Later on I found out he apparently fell off of an ATV and one behind him had run him over. No freaking clue how that was even possible. From Gothic LG my dad might qualify as one of these cases. I'm going to preface this with the fact my dad indulged in a lot of bad stuff at this time, which most likely contributed to the story. My dad had been in a car with his friends when the driver drove off of a cliff. 
Whether he did it intentionally or unintentionally has never been determined. Thanks to my dad's lack of belief in seatbelts at the time, he was thrown from the car, which caused his eye to pop out of its socket. The ER staff managed to pop it back in, and the eye in question is now a lazy eye, but he can still see out of it. I've seen pictures of my dad before this point, and it wasn't a lazy eye prior to this accident. Only after. Here's another story from Fauval. A lady was rushed into the ER in a cab, and the driver was completely freaking out. She had the handle of a knife sticking out the side of her head. She had been robbed, and the guy had attacked her, stabbing her freaking skull with a knife. The incredible part is that she was absolutely fine. She was super chill the whole time, and honestly, the sweetest old lady. She was so amazingly lucky that the blade of the knife didn't hit any major structures. She only lost partial sight in one of her eyes. From XSF Machine One time this guy was going number one and looking out his apartment window. All of a sudden, he saw his prom date fixing her dress with her mom, and their jaws just dropped to the ground. He started freaking out and accidentally zipped his fly all the way up. I heard the emergency responders yelling at him, asking how he managed to get his family jewels caught in the middle. From Disperunia I think the one of the most interesting things I ever saw in the emergency department was the opposite of an episode of untold stories of the ER that I literally saw a few days earlier. The patient in the episode was labeled as being acutely psychotic as she said something was crawling in her head. The doctor listened to her story and indeed believed his patient to be acutely psychotic. It was the physical exam that revealed that a fly laid eggs on her head and they had to remove multiple insects from her scalp by using Vaseline to suffocate the bugs. My patient, unfortunately, had the opposite. She was a highly respected member of the community. She went on a holiday and got worms in her private area. The gynecologist confirmed it for her under a microscope. Once the diagnosis was made, she could have easily been treated. She was given the requisite dosing of mebendazole, I think, that's a one-time dose, though sometimes you need a second to cure yourself within two weeks. Unfortunately, what the patient presented with was an acute psychotic break. She stated that she had worms coming out of her skin. The only way to get them was to chew walnuts and rub the chewed walnut paste against her skin to extract the worms. She rhythmically rocked in the bed while her husband sat by. She couldn't stop rubbing walnuts and saying, see, there's a worm. This went on for hours while we ran lab work, a CT scan of her head, and a substance screen. We even sent walnut worms for pathology. No positive results. Eventually, I had to admit the patient. The husband looked so defeated. I didn't feel comfortable with him having the strength to care for her. I don't know if I'll see that scene again. From Pistachio Lover some years ago, we had this patient who was diagnosed with breast cancer at an early stage. It was pretty treatable, and she wouldn't even need a mastectomy or chemo, just a lumpectomy plus radiation. Well, after some advice she got from some holistic healer, she backed up on the surgery and refused any of our recommended treatments. Apparently, her healer had told her that her cancer was the result of keeping a grudge on things and medical treatments were a scam that were colluded with the big pharma. Her whole care team tried to put some sense in her head, to no avail. Even the head of surgery tried to convince her, the social workers, the priest of the hospital chapel, yet she still said no. Fast forward a year and a half or so later, she comes back to the ER with a startling elevated temperature. The smell gave it away. Her breast was no longer there. It was just an open, bleeding mass, producing pus and filled with maggots. She went to the ER after her husband begged her for it, and she was still convinced her healer could cure her. Unfortunately, the scans showed it had already spread everywhere. She passed a month later. She was 35 and left three small kids and a heartbroken husband behind. From Anus Cakes It was my duty as an intern doctor in the ER. At around 3 p.m., a huge crowd rushed in with a guy on a stretcher. I could see his clothes were totally drenched in blood, and I hurried towards them. Well, I almost gasped when I saw what had happened. His private part was not intact, and it took me a few seconds to finally grasp what I was seeing 
before I could start assisting the senior doctor. The whole time I kept wondering how it happened. It came out in the newspaper the next day that the guy's girlfriend from his extramarital affair was responsible when he told her that he wanted to end their affair. Sad life. From Polanski, 1937. This happened to my brother while he was in med school. One day a guy strolled into the emergency room with the most extreme injury ever. He had the handle of a butcher knife sticking out from under one of his eyes. They did an x-ray on him and found the whole knife was indeed in there, sticking into his skull. Neurological tests also indicated that he was really lucky, as the knife didn't do any serious nerve or brain damage. After some debate, they decided to pull the knife out, but it was really stuck. Eventually, they laid the guy on his back, the ER doc took off his shoe, climbed up on the gurney, put his foot on the patient's forehead, and heaved the knife out. They put the guy on the ward, and the next morning, the authorities showed up to ask him about it. The guy just said, never mind, I'll take care of it. The next day, while nobody was looking, the guy got up and walked out. For people who didn't show up for their yearbook photo, they substituted the x-ray of the guy with the knife in his head. From CAOHBF I had a kid come in with a lesion in the back of her head. Her hair was a mess, and she had two wounds. I immediately suspected foul play. In hindsight, that was naive of me. I should have had that diagnosis by the smell alone. That was severe neglect, which can be far more damaging. I picked up my flashlight to better observe what was a yellowish-looking wound, and as soon as light touched the wound, the kid started screaming. Weirder still, the wound started moving. If anyone had washed that kid's head in the last six months, she would not have had myosis in her head. FYI, the final count was around 135 larvae. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who likes the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the contact social page at WeirdDarkness.com. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, click on Tell Your Story. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Bizarre Medical Cases was posted at Factinate.com. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions, and now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Zechariah 7 verses 9 and 10. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. And a final thought. Never dwell on decisions you regret. Learn from them. Every mistake makes you smarter and stronger. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey, weirdos. You've got a murder, Chef. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, March 2nd. Who killed her? He was wild dog, boy. This couldn't be done by a human person. We'll be spending two hours with Hexen Arcane, sisters Morgan and Celeste Parker. These sexy sirens, these gorgeous ghouls, will be presenting 1972's Moon of the Wolf, starring David Jansen, Barbara Rush, and Bradford Dillman. What did you find when you examined Ellie? Just that she was murdered. Dogs didn't do it. Like I said. After several locals are viciously murdered, a Louisiana sheriff starts to suspect he might be dealing with a werewolf. He's saying Lou Garou. Come on, how can you go wrong with a werewolf flick, am I right? Werewolf? He's saying werewolf. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in a live chat as we watch the movie. It's Moon of the Wolf on Saturday, March 2nd, hosted by Hexen Arcane.
The show begins at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and 7 p.m. Pacific. You can watch a trailer for the film and watch horror hosts and schlocky B-movies anytime, day or night on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. He says that I'm his next victim! Hope to see you March 2nd. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.